Today is August 17, 2019, and thank you so much for meeting me today here. Happy to be here. Lake. My pleasure. Can you please introduce yourself and tell me a bit about yourself? Do you want to go first, Jay? Sure. Uh, my name is Jay Turvey, and I am an actor at the Shaw Festival, but I've been acting since uh, I was in my 20s. And I'm a singer and uh, a writer, um, co-composer, and director. I think that's everything. And I'm Paul Sportelli. I am originally from the United States, from Connecticut, and uh, my training is in piano, uh, but I eventually got involved in musical theater, and I've been the music director at the Shaw Festival uh, for, this is my 21st season, and uh, I am a music director, as well as a composer, orchestrator, arranger, uh, I think that covers it. Yeah. Yeah. What drew you to musical theater? Mm. Well, I always loved singing as a, as a kid, and I didn't really like a lot of musical theater when I was growing up. I liked pop music more than that. But because I loved theater, uh, I ended up combining the two. And uh, once I got into musical theater, I realized there's a lot to love about it. I fell in love with musical theater from a very early age. My mom, uh, who is still alive, was a um, amateur actor and singer. And she used to do a lot of community theater. And they would do musicals. And uh, I loved, she would bring me to rehearsals. And I loved watching the rehearsals and going to the performances. So I loved musical theater from a very early age. And then in seventh grade I think I got involved at school doing the school musicals um, and because I was a pianist uh, I ended up being sort of the pianist musical director for these shows so that's I got into it at a pretty early age. Can you tell me about your training? Did you go to some college university? How mm -hmm. did you choose where to study it? Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of did it in a roundabout way so I I uh, was accepted at uh, Ryerson Theatre School in Toronto and I went there for less than a year and realized it didn't, it, it didn't work for me, it, I didn't really fit in. So then I went back to university and I studied English and French and was acting on the side in the community and at university as well. Uh, so I really didn't have a lot of formal training and started taking singing lessons once I started getting professional jobs because people would say you have a raw talent but you need to refine it so I started studying after I found work. And my uh, training is all in classical piano so I did my undergraduate degree at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York and then my master's and my doctorate at the Manhattan School of Music in New York City. Uh, getting into theater, theater was always something I did and then when I was in New York, I just got more and more involved in theater. Um, I used to play piano in the piano bars in New York and cabaret shows. And I got to meet a lot of actors that way, who then asked me to help coach them. Then they would sometimes ask me to come to their auditions to play for them. And uh, that led to me becoming an audition pianist, working for different casting directors and productions. And then I started subbing on Broadway shows and doing rehearsal piano for Broadway shows. Then eventually getting a Broadway show uh, where I was uh, the second associate conductor and the pianist for the show. It was Andrew Lloyd Webber's Aspects of Love. And that led me to realize that if I wanted to go any further in musical theater, I needed to be a conductor. So I didn't have any training in conducting. Um, but I kind of trained myself and did well at Aspects of Love and then started getting offered jobs as a, a music director. But a lot of what I do as a music director, and here at the Shaw Festival where I have to adapt orchestrations and do, do some composing, um, a lot of that is self-taught. But I kind of took all I had learned from my degrees in classical piano and then just try to 
sort of apply that to what I needed to know and uh, apply as a music director. Uh, you began writing songs together in 1995, right? Mm -hmm. Did your collaborative process change over time? Hmm. Um, I would say fundamentally not an awful lot. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1995 we were part of a group called Septext, which was uh, what would you call it? Well, it was, it was a string quartet. string quartet. I was the pianist, and then there was a male singer and a female singer. Jay was the male singer. And we would, we would uh, do riffs on uh, pop music, and Paul and others would arrange them for string quartet, and so it was kind of a take on that. But it also had a theatrical element, and we were approached by a poet, mm -hmm. I don't remember how we met him or knew him. I think Karen Graves. Okay. Somebody, uh, a colleague, put us in, him in touch with us because he was launching a poetry uh, collection, and he wanted us to set one of his poems to music. I think it was actually, we thought it would be fun to set one oh, of his okay. poems, and he agreed. Okay, he great. Went along with that. Yeah, so the first time we collaborated, we were collaborating on adapting somebody else's text. That didn't, so that didn't happen very often after that, although it has happened a few times. Mm -hmm. But I would say fundamentally our process is kind of the same. Do you want to outline it? Well, usually text comes first for us. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a complete text, but we usually go in with a pretty good rough and then I'll sit at the piano and Jay will start singing and anytime we think something good might come up, on goes the recording device and we just keep sort of documenting our composition as we're working on it through time uh, until we feel like we have a first draft and then I will usually start transcribing it. Once it's transcribed then we'll go back and revise and there are times when we start the composition part that Jay will go back in and retool a lyric or or change things but generally for us the text comes first and leads the composition. Do you use uh, a rhyming dictionary or a thesaurus? Yeah, I, I definitely a rhyming dictionary. Uh, I used to be averse to it and then I found out that Stephen Sondheim uses a rhyming dictionary all the time. Uh, it just opens, it's just a wider range of possibilities and sometimes even if you don't use the words that you see it will make you think of another way of, of going about it. So yes I do, not, not always. I find that uh, rhyming dictionaries can sometimes lead you to be too fancy and that actually simple words are the best communicators so it can, it can lead you down the wrong path. Thesaurus, I, I don't think I've ever used. I probably have just, but it's not. It's not something I rely on. Uh, Jay does most of the lyric writing in our collaboration, but there have been times when I've looked at a rhyming dictionary as well. Yeah. What are the ways of being honest without being destructive? <laughs> you mean with each other? Well, I think it's just all. I mean, it's the, the words you choose. You, you might just say that doesn't fit rather than this is a terrible idea or something like that, you know. Um, I think we tend to be pretty respectful when we're in the process. One of the, one of the things I would say is uh, sometimes when you're in the moment of creation it's, it's, and, and it's not just one of us. If I was working by myself I would you know, maybe have a more sense of flow. So you do have to be accommodating of the other person's uh, second thoughts or I want to throw this in. So I would say the times when there might be a little bit of frustration, but it's, it's never destructive, is that uh, I want to get an idea out or Paul wants to get an idea out and the other person is, is going back on the line before or something like that. So that can be moments when you just have to negotiate and but without being destructive but generally I would agree with that and I think the reason it can become 
a little tense is you might feel like you're about to do something really great and so you're wanting to go in a certain direction and if the other person is wanting to go back or go somewhere else you're you can be afraid that you're going to lose what's about to happen if you if you let too much time go by or don't get to it right in the moment um, but I would say we both acknowledge like one thing that I think we believe in and put into practice is it's not good to edit yourself too soon, that you've got to get the ideas out, and once they're out, then, then there's always the chance to judge them, or discard them, or choose this over that. Um, but our experience is that if you are too critical too soon, when it should be all about getting things out, that that's not great. So that implies, or I think we both know, that that means we're both going to have lots of bad ideas, and that's okay. So we're getting that information out there. Because we know that about ourselves, I think we are pretty okay about the other person saying, no, I don't think that's the right chord. No, I think this chord is better. Or, no, I don't think the melody should go that way. Or I think that's the wrong feel. <coughs> it's totally fine. Yeah. How do you write the book? <sighs> Um, well, um, a couple of times, am I right a couple of times, at least once we've adapted an, an existing book with Tristan, it, it was a short story by, or a novella, by Thomas Mann, so that had an existing structure, so that is a much different process. I, um, I guess it just depends on, on each individual process, like how you go about writing the book, but I, generally I think you just, you start, <laughs> and usually I think I find I start at the beginning. I think, uh, I can't think of a moment or an instance where I thought, well, I'm going to write the end first, or I'm going to write the middle first, but uh, that's probably the most murky process, I would say. Uh, just kind of, you just start wading your way through, and 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 perhaps you don't even know who the entire cast of characters are going to be, but they start to appear, and uh, it, it's uh, it's not as um, laid out as a the you know the chord progressions in a song or a rhyming scheme. It really has its own shape. Uh, which is shapeless until you start pulling things together. I think going into writing the book, we know the story. We know the story that we want to tell more or less. Uh, but then how we tell it, and sometimes we'll go in knowing song placement. Like in our story, there will probably be a song about this and a song about that. But as we're writing, we can get new ideas for songs, or scenes can then suggest to us, ooh, maybe this is a song, or there could be a song in this scene. And so everything, like Jay says, it's kind of like moving pieces. And the story may change a little as we go along, uh, and details in the story will change. So I guess what I'm saying is we don't, we don't do like, a storyboard within an inch of its life and just know this is exactly how it's going to play itself out. Uh, we go in with, as I said, more or less a sense of the story and the story that we want to tell. But one of the exciting things about it is as you're writing, it changes. You know, and there, there's many writers who say things like, you start writing the story, but then the story starts mm -hmm. writing you, or the story starts writing itself. So then there's this really dynamic quality between you and then this thing that is already now in existence and that can often inform you of where it, it wants to go. I remember uh, when we were working on one of our pieces called Maria Severa, we knew that there was going to be a tragedy, <laughs> but we didn't know exactly what that tragedy was going to be. And I remember being at the gym, and I think I went over to Paul and said, I know who's going to die and I know how it's going to happen. So. That, that's kind of uh, an addition to what Paul just said, which is that the, the story starts writing itself. What inspires you? 
<laughs> uh, other people's music, for sure. Uh, books, literature, other people's stories. Uh, for sure, the, uh, I find the movies, films, uh, I find the more you have uh, this kind of uh, background of other people's exciting work and uh, uh, you just have kind of a, you, you create an even deeper and, and richer well to draw from so that some of these things start coming out of your subconscious. And uh, I think it's really important to keep nurturing that. I find if we've been on too much of a roll of writing and writing and writing, uh, you do start to feel like, I can still do this, but it's feeling a little like the ground is getting bare and I need to replenish a bit. I would also say, I mean, I agree with all of that. And we do see a lot of movies, plays, musicals. Um, we read a lot of books. And I think we enjoy art that is transformative, where you as the listener or viewer, the, the audience, um, the piece takes you somewhere, that there's a quality of transcendence, or um, that it really takes you somewhere, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, and because we like that, because we like to experience that, I think it excites us to write with the hope of bringing that to other people. And so I would say that that's something pretty central probably to everything we've written, that mm -hmm. sense of that um, what we write can transform or transport, that kind of thing. How do you draw the line between expressing yourself and repeating yourself? Uh, I think, I, th I like to think that we don't or haven't repeated ourselves very much. Um, I think there are times when I've started to write a song or we started to work on a song like that. I think we've done a version of this before, so let's not go in that direction. So I think as long as you're very aware of your back catalog, um, it's also just boring. <laughs> I, I don't know that I would be interested in doing another version of something that I've already worked on. Also because it just takes so much time and so much energy. Uh, I, I wouldn't be interested in doing something that was asking me to basically repeat myself. However, what I would say is that I think there are certain themes or mm -hmm. ideas yes. that are common to many of our pieces. We had a friend visit a year or two ago, and she was very, very interested in like reading and listening to our pieces. And, you know, we try to be, we don't inflict our pieces on people. It's like if people want to come see our shows, if they're being produced somewhere, great. If they want to listen to recordings, great. But we don't force them. But she was very, very eager to read scripts and listen to recordings and demos. And she really got a good sense of a number of our musicals and said, there, there are clear themes that you guys are working out. It, they're all very different worlds, these musicals, but um, certainly this is something that you continue to investigate in different ways. Um, so, like I would agree with Jay, I don't think we are formulaic or uh, set out to repeat ourselves or end up repeating ourselves, but um, I do think that there are certain things as an artist that you keep exploring and returning to. Can you give me an example of the teams that keep returning in your work? Uh, the redeeming power of art and music. That a lot of the plays that we've written are about people finding solace or uh, enlightenment uh, or something transformative through uh, pursuing music, most likely music, but not always. Yeah, that would be true in Tristan, Maria Severa, Maria Severa 33 and a third, 33 and a third uh, Eric with a K, mm -hmm. for sure. I, I think we enjoy writing musicals and plays about people who have artistic tendencies. 
uh, just because it allows a much larger uh, realm of expression. So a lot of the people we have written about or are attracted to are th themselves artists. So that's why we go down that road. Do considerations of being producible affect how you approach work? For example, do you use reduced orchestration to meet the demands of a smaller house in Canada? I would say we do think about that. Um, now, having said that, okay, so we think about cast size and orchestra size. Having said that, I think our natural inclination is to write more intimate chamber style musicals anyway. Um, but yes, I think that we think about cast size and producibility, and so if we can write a show that has three characters or four characters, um, and we really feel like those are enough characters to carry it, for sure. And I mean, with orchestrations, you can always adapt. So, uh, for instance, 33 and a Third was just done at the Dobama Theater in Cleveland with a cast of five and a band of three. We had originally conceived 33 and a Third for a band of four. We were willing to downsize to three. If the show were to ever take off in a way where the producers wanted to expand the size of the orchestra, I would be totally happy to, to do that. So you can always grow things up, but um, yeah, I think we are pretty conscious of let's, let's make things as producible as possible. In, in Canada, just it's very rare that a, a, a musical with 12 people, I mean it happens, but it, it's very rare because it just costs so much money. How do you choose collaborators? Well, um, I mean, we're lucky mm -hmm. that we collaborate so well and have such a good working relationship. Sometimes the project has, the, the collaborators have chosen us. So we've been approached a couple of times to, to collaborate with others. And so I would say, do you mean collaborators to write with or collaborators to like work on a piece with? I uh, work on a piece with like Eric Wool, for example, mm -hmm. or like Morvin Brabna, sorry if I mispronounce it. No, you're all. absolutely right. Yeah, so in both of those cases, we were approached by both of those people, Morwin and Eric, were, had existing material that they wanted to work on with us. So, I mean, luckily, both of those people we got along with well, and it, it went well, but we, I don't think we've actively sought out... I mean, we've, we've certainly been in a position where people say, well, who would you like to direct this, or who would you like to workshop this? And in that case, you know, you just... You go with people who... The, the longer I'm in this business, the more I'm interested in working with people who have uh, similar temperaments and are generous in the room and uh, uh, can create an environment where something like that can grow. Uh, so I think we generally go with like-minded rather than somebody who we know is has a reputation but might be difficult. I'm not really interested in that process. Let's talk about workshops. How early in the process are you willing to show, you know, your piece to someone, to students? Pretty or? early. What we generally do is when we have a first draft of a new musical, we will assemble a group of actors to learn the music, to work on the piece in order to give a first presentation, which we often do here at Shaw. So we'll pick a night and pick a rehearsal hall and invite, you know, people from the company and friends uh, to come and see sort of the first draft. And I suppose you could call that a workshop, although it's not usually so much about workshopping in the true sense as it is, let's just teach it to them, get everyone comfy with the music and lyrics and the book, and then put it out there for the first time so that we learn a lot from that first mm -hmm. airing. We have done some readings sometimes when we don't touch the music, when we just have people read the book. Yep. Uh, just because that's really helpful to have people reading the book aloud. 
But we're not, I don't, I'm trying to think, like you ask how early on, I don't think very often we've had people involved in working the material before we had a shape. Like I don't, I don't remember ever doing like, like we've got three songs and one scene, let's, no. let's, it's usually we feel like thing. we have a rough whole package. Yeah. And I think we feel like it's a viable version of the show. Yeah. Uh, knowing that we will probably change it a lot, but we feel like we're going to present something that is a possible version of it, as opposed to, we don't go in saying, it's a first draft, we don't have an ending, it's a big mess, I know this doesn't make sense, and I know that doesn't make sense, but we're going to present it anyway. We wouldn't present under those circumstances. But when we feel like we have a good first draft that that makes sense and holds together, we're happy to put it out there. And where do you workshop your musicals? I know that there are several places like Sheridan or like here. How do you choose where to do it? Mm. Well, Sher again, Sheridan, we you have to apply, which is part of the Canadian Music Theatre Project. So we've, we've uh, workshopped two of our pieces there. So that's something that you apply for and hopefully get into. So that was a very fortunate process. Because it's what six weeks? Yeah, it's 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 a lot of you get a lot of time, which yeah. is fantastic because it really gives you time to pull the piece apart and try all different kinds of things. Whereas if you're doing like a, a three or a four day workshop, you have to not that you can't get things done, but you usually have to go in with a plan, and then if you're going to deviate from that plan, you have to be really efficient in how you rewrite and work. So yeah, the, the CMTP at Sheridan is fantastic for giving you a lot of space to, to experiment and, and try different things. We've workshopped here. We have. Yeah, and, we, and the one that we did here at Tarragon for Maria's... The workspace program for Tristan. For Tristan. For Tristan. That was great because it was, again, it, it was more than a week. It was like 10 days or something, I think, wasn't it? But I, I, I just saying that Paul is absolutely right because if you do something that's like three days here or four days here, it's very you can see where the mistakes are or the whatever you need to change. But unless and we have done this, you you rewrite after the second night and throw things at people on the for the third day, um, you're kind of stuck with what you no is not necessarily really working well, but you don't have enough time to try it out on people unless you stay up all night writing, which we have done <laughs> in some cases. Uh, what's the difference between the role of composer, musical director, arranger, and orchestrator? Like, how do you work on music, all of you together? Uh, composer is probably the most separate, because you are generating something new. Uh, it's like there's a blank canvas and then you're going to put something on that canvas. Whereas when you're arranging or orchestrating, now I can arrange and orchestrate something I composed, but I can also arrange or orchestrate something that someone else has composed. And arranging and orchestrating certainly overlap, but arranging can refer to how you treat the composition structurally. Uh, you might repeat back to the bridge, or you might have a breakdown section where then instruments come back in one by one. Now that technically is orchestration, but um, you decide instead of a four bar intro, it's going to have a 16 bar intro, or between the end of the first chorus and the beginning of the second chorus, there's going to be this little interlude. So that that would be arranging. If you then get in there and decide, here's what the strings play, here's what the winds play, the brass, uh, the rhythm section, then you're into orchestration. Um, so usually with the musicals we do here at the Shaw Festival, uh, I have to adapt the orchestration, um, but we're more or less sticking to the structure of the songs and the musical score. However, we might want to make cuts to a dance sequence. And if we get in there and make cuts to the dance sequence, how we're going to put this part with this part and make sure it flows, that's arranging. 
So those, those are, that's how I would define or differentiate those things. And then as a music director, um, you may simply be inheriting a composition uh, and an orchestration and arrangements, and then as the music director, you just want to best understand or presume to understand. Like, you, you need to um, ascribe meaning to what those other people have done. Like, why do, does the brass do what it's doing here? Why is there more time between these sections of the song than these sections of the song? Why did the composer and lyricist do this the way they did it? You need to understand that so that you can bring that to the cast, the rest of the creative team, the orchestra, and hopefully inspire people and uh, give them information that's going to help them build what they need to build in a show. So when you write your own musical, do you only compose or are you a music director as well? Do you arrange? It's been both. It's been yeah, both. That's um, right. On Little Mercy's First Murder, Tristan, Maria Severa, I was the music director. Uh, with 33 and a third, both at the Dobama Theater and when it was done at the Canadian Musical Theater Project, I was not the music director. And when we did Eric with a K at CMTP, I was not the music director. And, and Maria Severa in Poland as well. And that's right, uh, I was not. So I enjoy bringing, I enjoy working on my own pieces, but there are times when it either doesn't make sense practically for me to do it, or I think at CMTP it's actually great for me to focus mostly on the composition instead of wearing two hats. Because um, it does allow, when, when we're presenting, say, for the first time, and I'm almost always at the piano the first time, I'm going to have an impression of the piece, but I'm inside it, whereas Jay is not inside it. And when we talk about the experience afterwards, sometimes he has insights because he has a little more perspective than I do when I'm inside it. And uh, so I think that's why there is a value to my not always musically directing our, our compositions. I think one of the things that I do notice, which is hard to do when you're inside a piece, in the same way that if I'm acting, it's hard for me to judge the entirety of the evening. Uh, one of the things is momentum and pace. And when you stand outside uh, and watch something that you've written, uh, you can easily see, oh, this feels like a lull, this feels to me to be tightened up. Whereas I think when you're just in the midst of doing the piece, uh, that's a harder thing to see. I think that's because as performing artists, I think just sort of a given is that we're going to bring positivity to what it is we're doing. Mm -hmm. that, that if I'm at the piano, and we're presenting a musical, for, for those two and a half hours, uh, everything in me is wanting it to go well, and everything in me is hoping to be receiving information from my brain and soul that it is going well. So, uh, and if I were to abandon that feeling, or if that feeling were to change in me during the course of my performing that thing, that arc, it might be harder for me to do my job. Yeah. Whereas when you're simply in the audience taking notes or just like, there's our piece, I can be thinking it's going well or I can be thinking it's not going well. It's not affecting the art experience. Mm -hmm. Like that generation is happening regardless of your thoughts in the house. Whereas I might impact the art being created if my state of mind is not. Oh, Positive. yes, yes, and I've, I've certainly experienced that as an actor when you start. It's a bad road to go down to be sort of judging how the whole thing is going or to be constantly judging the piece while you're doing it. It's just best to just do it. <laughs> so both of you have many different jobs in theater. Mm -hmm. How do you balance all of them? <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's always a juggle. Um, 
to do all we do as like you as a director and an actor, me as a music director, that is almost enough. We've chosen to be writers on top of that, which puts too much on our plate. So there's just not enough hours in the day. But we've asked ourselves, do we give up the acting and directing and music directing? And we say no, because we would miss it. And it really informs our writing. Well, do we give up the writing? No, because that in a way is the most important thing to us. So we're always in a situation where we wish there were more hours in the day. And you just carve time out when you, when you can. Um, generally for us, it's the writing that we have to find time to do. Yes, I think uh, that was one of the things that we've learned going along with this process is you actually just have to treat it, you look at the schedule for the week and you go, well, for these four hours, no other interruptions except for writing. And we have to do that uh, just to make sure that it doesn't fall by the wayside. And, you know, there are many, uh, you, end, you end up being socially a little less active than, you know, the, I'm, I'm, there's, uh, actors like to go out, actors like to party, everybody does. But, you know, more often than not saying, sorry, I can't do that, uh, or it, just not being quite as available socially, that's one of the things that, that tends to happen. But I find the writing more rewarding anyway. <laughs> um, the writing, yeah, the writing won't take care of itself. Like no. We have to say, let's do it today, or let's do it tomorrow, let's find times to do it. Our work here at the Shaw Festival, we are told to show up, right? Like we're told, this is when your performances are, and this is when we start rehearsals, and you have to be at rehearsals. So um, that, not that we don't have to do our homework and do our work when we're being asked to do our work, but that's going to take care of itself.